welcome to pekona monthly webinar today's webinar leader is reverend dr evangeline anderson tajkumar reverend dr evangeline tajkumar is a womanist theologian who has taught feminist and liberation theologies in different seminaries for over two decades presently she is serving as a pastor of two congregations in the indiana and kentucky synod of the evangelical lutheran church in america the topic for her discussion today is faith role and identity of the body of christ the theological and missional challenges today i'm very happy to welcome her to lead the discussion today now over to dr evangeline the first thing i would like to say is this because of this familiarity of pattern of violence against people of minority faiths and minority religions it is impossible undesirable to have a christian identity just for the christians you cannot talk about christian identity in isolation because christian identity cannot be counted in terms of numbers christian identity to be perceived in terms of the influence and that faith and that belief that we hold on to as much as share increase replicate as our values and our faith would be a better way of looking at the faith and growing faith of christianity and christians in any given context because i said that there is that familiarity of the pattern of violence practiced by this dominant powers in any given context it is important for christians not to isolate themselves and consider just christian bodies as those persecuted bodies as those punished bodies as those discriminated bodies but open our eyes wider and re- realize that there are muslim bodies that there are the tribal and the adivasi ba- bodies that are also devalued discriminated in this process and that is part of the project of hindutva part of the project of patriarchy and unless and until we connect these issues together it will not be possible for us to talk about our faith our role and our identity today when we talk about the dalit identity especially we see that there is once again a familiarity of pattern in othering of bodies in naming those bodies as the polluting other as the insignificant other the uh, dispensable other so this denying of dalit body as something that is worth that is uh, of filled with dignity etc to deny them that human dignity is also part of the hindutva project in creating and constructing a christian identity my my challenge to this group gathered here today is simply this would it be possible for us to expand the horizons of our thinking and look at the meaning the significance of the life breath 
as the common, the tangible, the core uh, aspect that makes us absolutely equal. Life breath, in other words, as the sole significant tangible symbol of grace. Sole significant symbol of our identity. To recognize this common identity, common dignity, common human identity, would be a way of affirmation of the body of Christ, the identity of the body of Christ. I wanted to say, if we do not recognize this all-inclusive, absolutely embracing idea of a community, of family, within this Christian framework, we would be failing in our uh, duty to um, understand the significance of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that God gave his only begotten son. We say because God so loved the world. And for us to realize that this loving of the whole world Embracing of the whole world is affirmation of that common human dignity and affirmation of or the recognition of the image of God in one another. Let me just pause here for a minute and invite questions, invite your reflections as to how we can strengthen this Christian identity, this understanding of Christian identity as something that embraces people of all faiths, especially those whose bodies are targeted, just like the Christian bodies, those who are persecuted. So consider this as the first pause in our webinar. Thank you. There's somebody who... Well, I, I'm just going to say that that was amazing. Um, thank you. Um, I mean, I think to have a, a generous view, very generous view of what it means to be Christian in a pluralistic kind of situation and also to, because we're Christian, to advocate for those who are oppressed um, in all of its manifestations is, you know, I think central to our, our identity. Um, I've just spent the week in Buffalo um, where people are really struggling <laughs> there with um, the uh, American form of caste, which uh, Isabel Wilkerson has done such a great job of showing the parallels between caste among African Americans in the United States and caste in India. And um, we, you know, for your, your comments about Christian nationalism here, um, really resonates in that regard. Thank you, uh, Dr. Koshi. Thank you, Pastor Evangeline. I agree with Pastor Cook, uh, Peter Cook, that it was a very inspiring uh, start to our conversation. Thank you for the work you're doing. You know, when I think about comparative liberation theologies, uh, Pastor Peter Cook mentioned caste in America is the problem of race, and Martin Luther King's visit to the Dalit community in the 60s is, is a part of that history. You know, as Christians, we have to talk about love, mercy, compassion, understanding, and patience. These are the virtues that Jesus himself you know, epitomized. But when we look at 20th century liberation theologies, if it's James Cohn, for example, in the Black American context, or Gutierrez in the Latin American context, you know, we struggle with the commitment to 
peace and justice, <clears throat> which looks like it maintains the status quo, but in the Indian context, since Ambedkar, prior to Ambedkar, for people are just you know for struggling for that sense of motivation to expose the the evil of the caste system, the darkness that it represents. Just like Cohn says, that the darkness of white supremacy is satanic in its proportions. So, so can you give us some perspective in your next phase about, you know, when we talk about Dalit liberation theologies, how do we balance the needs of the Christian inclination towards peace and loving the enemy and patience with the urgency of a movement to to eradicate the caste system? These are some of the issues I struggle with myself. Maybe I will just respond to these first two in a, you know, a comprehensive response, maybe. May 25th, 2020, we all know what happened to George Floyd. And even as the weight of the knee was upon the neck of George Floyd, For us to imagine what history would have looked like if it wasn't for that cell phone recording that incident. So, value of life breath, value of life based on the color of our skin and dismissing of history itself, life itself as unworthy to be remembered at all, to be dismissed in total, is part and parcel of casteism and racism. Devaluing the body, devaluing human life and life breath. It's just two years. And even before two years, we already have this Buffalo shooting. And what shocks us is that it is not just another incident of shooting, you know, making that number go up as to how many shootings there was in one year, you know, add to the statistics. But if you look at, what that 18 year old had planned for how long and how even though he gave enough kind of uh, warnings or uh, you know, he let out that uh, message so clear to a wider public that this violence that already existed as a plan and a plot could be held together as the secret by the colluding silence of a majority, of many more, let me put it that way. So for every incident of such a violence, racist violence, Dali, violence against the Dalits, for us to tease out that incident and see how the society, the larger society, how the state, how the different machinery in the state, like the law enforcement, the judiciary, the state itself colludes and offers impunity on a platter to those who perpetuate violence. The plot that I see, the pattern that I see is the hope that people will learn to absorb that violence and much more to come so that there will be a point in history when our bodies will become numb when we will already become lifeless, breathless, while we still breathe. If that is the common uh, threat, life breath as, you know, 
the life breath of the Dalits, the Blacks, the minority, if that is counted as a threat to people, the, those in power, it is not enough for us just to name those incidents of violence. We keep, we, uh, you know, how I, what I feel is this, we have kept threading through these incidents of violence and the string is long. It is too long in history. We have beaded them together. We have beaded them together. And we have been faithful in doing that. We have, you know, for every incident of persecution reported, for every incident of violence against the Dalit bodies reported, at least five to 10 go unreported, unreported. So what, el what is the statistics? So I believe that there has to be a radical shift in our imagination of an alternative, in our theologies, in, our, in the way in which people are formed and informed in seminaries. I don't know, I would just like to, comment and say that um, many times uh, in, in Christianity, but also in, um, in the social context with, with vying ideologies that go around, um, we miss the fact that uh, one of the underlying principles in, in the Christian faith is the unity of mankind. Uh, we talk about different races, but um, the, the Christian belief is that we all have, <clears throat> have one primordial parent, uh, that we all have descended uh, from uh, one um, source, so that we are all basically the same race, even though there may be different uh, sections of it. Um, so there, you know, and that whole human race is reflected or has the image of God imprinted on it. Um, so that, you know, even though uh, we may have different beliefs, um, that basic human dignity applies to us all. And uh, the people that may believe differently from us or may look different from us um, are still uh, entitled uh, to the same dignified treatment that we would expect for ourselves. Um, this is reflected in so many areas of, of, of scripture and in so many ways that, uh, that it's really uh, not excusable for us to ignore it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, uh... In the name of Jesus, who himself was so inclusive and embracing of people, of cultures, we cannot afford to dismiss anybody and say that, uh, you know, somebody, anybody cannot be part of this human family, human community. So it, it becomes absolutely using Jesus as the way principle, except that you do not consider Jesus identity, you know, the Christian identity as a narrow, a club identity, an association identity. But look upon Jesus' identity, uh, Jesus, the name, the Christian identity as essentially inclusive. It is, uh, uh, and just another point there, it is not because we consider joining with all the minority, all those wounded bodies, all those persecuted bodies together as a strategy. No, 
It is not a strategy for us to be together. It is the calling. It is, it is what God wants us to be, to be a sibling, to be a family and to recognize in the face of another, even in the face of an enemy, the face of God. American Christian nationalism is growing and it's embracing this uh, racist replacement theory and many other, many other fringe conspiracies. And, uh, and in India, Hindutva is growing. And it, it seems that the parallels are that they're largely driven by fear. And, and that fear is that they will lose power and that they they talk about changing the culture but it's really a loss of their centralized power by maintaining majoritarian control and that seems to me that there's it's it, it may be driven by uh political pure secular political influence infil infiltrating the religious structure in in both instances and many other instances and I'm wondering what comments you would have regarding that. Mm -hmm. That is exactly, you said it, Gary. For us to connect that 2014 and 2016 is also so important. 2014, when BJP comes to power and with this formula of Ache Din, good days are going to come. And in 2016, you know, or, uh, you know, preceding that, to say, make America great again. It is holding out something as a carrot for people to say, hey, you are better off with us and we will make sure that those bodies that whom, you know, whom you should fear, who will take your rights away, who will, who will make it more difficult for you to enjoy the benefits of life, so to create and invent and engineer that fear is you find a common, it is a common root in both democracies, Hindutva as well as in Christian nationalism. And I'm not saying that this is a new thing that has come with Christian nationalism only now, but you definitely see that the goal of using that uh, fear mongering as a weapon is not an accident because fear is what drives faith out. It is only fear that can replace faith. And therefore, what better way than to project the face of the enemy to imagine the face of the enemy as that black other, that Dalit other, that female other, or that uh, Christian Muslim other. So this othering is also a very normal process of denying the right and dignity to these bodies. So there's a lot of commonality and what we refuse to see is, you know, we take these incidents of, uh, say, persecution of Christians in India as isolated incidents. It's only that incident. It's bad. It's, uh, you know, we, you feel bad for that pastor, for that church, etc. But we forget to see the pattern that emerges. And when we do that, when we, when we have this distorted image of our reality, we join, we, we are silent to that projection of uh, a rule to say, deny your history. You don't need that history. We will create an alternate history for you. So there are a lot of familiarities in uh, the patterns that uh, happen right now, you know, in both Hindutva as well as uh, 
in uh, Christian nationalism. So na uh, that triumphalism, Christian triumphalism is so closely associated with that desire for Hindu Rashtra. How different is it? How can we not understand this uh, majoritarian uh, kind of a complex, the desire to say, this is our land, you are all foreigners, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that Modi tries to, uh, you know, come up with. And, uh, you know, just this morning, I received this uh, note about the AICU, you know, coming out with this statement saying that, yes, there's so much of violence and it has really come to the peak and we have to uh, share this, you know, uh, the person in charge communicating this fear, communicating this uh, understanding of what we have come to, to the prime minister. And I was thinking to myself, it's like asking the fox, do you know how we can protect our chickens? Do you know what has happened to our chickens? The fox must be laughing. Modi must be laughing. If we go and ask him, what shall we do? How do you know, why don't you stop? Because he is the reason. His silence is the reason. So this will continue to happen unless and until the Christian, um, unless the church realizes that it is a dead body if it does not belong to the body of Christ. If with Christ as the head, we are the body of Christ. The church can be the body of Christ. But if we negate, dismiss, People, human beings, our fellow human beings, in the name of God, the church cannot be the body of Christ. And that's where I wanted to lay this out pretty clear to say our faith, role, and our identity. It's held together by this Christic principle. Inclusivity, love. Sorry, there I go preaching again. John wanted to. John, John Prabhudas. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> the two things you mentioned uh, brought uh, home. Uh, one was the uh, the cutting open of a pregnant woman in uh, uh, Ahmedabad, outskirts of Ahmedabad. Uh, in the, the aftermath of Godra riots, I was uh, I was in that woman's house about two months after that happened. It's a pretty surreal moment. Um, until then, it is a statistics. Um, but you stand in her living room to talk to her parents. It's uh, it's a different uh, understanding. So. Since that time onwards, and, and I've been in Kandamal as well, meeting with victims. And one common thing that you rightly said, the othering is a um, very effective tool. One time, uh, this guy, this new, new age guru, uh, Sri Sri, was in Washington, was confronting him on, on a lot of issues because just before coming to DC, he made a statement to me, denounced his statement and, and uh, long story short, uh, he wanted to sit down and talk about some differences, difference of opinions. And I, and I asked him, I said, you know, why, why are you guys uh, doing this? Uh, well, I didn't say ask him why he was. I said, the leaders that you appreciate so much are creating this otherness. And then he acknowledged one thing, that 
that to bring the masses together, it is not, the love doesn't bring masses together. It is the hate of the others bring the masses together. Um, so the othering becomes very essential part of that building your base. Now, I, I understand what he says. I understand the human factor that lies behind it. But here is my problem with it. Maybe perhaps you could see what you think about. The othering is not a new idea. The Old Testament of the Bible has always othered people, has always said it's God's own people, as if the others are not. The Old Testament of the Bible, when Jews were slaves in Egypt, kept together by the very fact that they were able to convince them that don't mingle with the other. So my question today is, if othering plays a role, how can we, I mean, this, this I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be the devil's advocate here. I'm trying to clarify my own thoughts in this thing. How can we say, you know, I'm sure you have gone through Sam Huntington's uh, the clash of civilizations of the art theory. And, 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 and people are, by nature, they are tribes. Their families come together on some common ground and they get together. And several families come together as a tribe. It's always that throughout the human history. It's not something that's invented by Modi or for that matter, Trump. It is, um, it is, it is an intrinsic human nature to bond with, to bind with your own. And we can see that examples in the Bible. Now, how do we at this stage say that that's evil? Only the Christian theology, Christian doctrine has an answer to it. And how can we say that? Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, begin with this statement. In God's plan, difference is not the problem, but differential value added to the difference is the problem. Let me repeat. Difference is not the problem. Plurality is something we celebrate that was, that was there as part of God's creation. Plurality, diversity, difference, part of God's creation. We affirm our difference. But the moment we are fixed that there's a differential value in a difference, and gather a community around it to conquer, to support their values. You do find that tribalism, you do find that inventing the other, distancing the other, eliminating the other becomes part of that survival strategy and uh, celebrating one's own unique identity and so on. The way the church, the Christian community has understood God choosing a nation, a people, however hard they try to understand, understand that as a way of monopolizing God and as a privileged community to access God's blessings and push 
to a higher uh, limit, their own stance, their own kind of elevation in hum among humanity, that has been constantly pushed to say, you are, you know, the meaning of being chosen is to is to be a lens through which people will see God's universality of grace. God's way that God is related to the world. God is in love with the world, the whole world. That is the purpose of being called, being called, being chosen. So instead, what we have today is Christians, even in India, claiming their identity with Israel, that Zionist approach, because you consider yourself as that called, ordained, and that uh, kind of chosen people is something that actually acts against the purpose and plan of God for the whole of creation. So anytime anybody, any clan, any group, any religion claims, you know, makes truth claims about their particularity or their uh, chosenness, for us to know that the gap becomes wider. It breaks down the community. God's purpose, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, uh, it's definitely uh, the human sin and the predicament, as you can call it, as a way of uh, creating this tribalism and that uh, unique identity uh, concept. That is the human nature, the human aspiration for uniqueness and truth claims. I'll pause there, John. But we can kind of continue our conversation. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but I mean, the, the Israelis, Israelites saw themselves as a unique people. And they refused to mingle with the others, right? Now, in the time of the prophets, you have, uh, you have um, well, what we call, what we identify or what, what we recognize as the word of God was given to a certain people. So there is this othering there is this community of different communities which uh, are various communities do present and it's uh, it's accepted it's recognized perhaps the treatment of the other by the one are uh, you know um, in in one case you can say uh, Hindus are, in one case, you can say Jewish people are, uh, are in America, you could even say uh, the privileged white community. Um, how they interact with others, how they see others, how they value others or disrespect others. That could be a problem. Then creating this, we are all one, we are all ban homie, you know, Kumbaya, is that, Absolutely. Is, Absolutely. is that something that I, can you, I'm sorry, I'll stop there. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of add a line for that. I do believe that the tendency of majority of the church or the Christian community is to sing Kumbaya and to celebrate their unique identity and close their eyes and ears hard, you know, turn away from this Christian nationalism or that white supremacy or that Hindutva ideology. 
it's like saying, okay, you don't see it. You don't watch it. You, you be a good Christian. That piety consciousness is a way of coping with the present day reality. And that exactly is what we need to shift. We need to unearth and say that Christian identity cannot be defined, described in isolation, but Christian identity, the, the starting point for our identity is to recognize the absolute goodness of creation, of creation and God's plan of absolute and utter commonality. That's uh, what I'm suggesting. Uh, I'd like to throw an idea out there uh, because I'm intrigued by John's question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, you know, there is an othering. Um, uh, you know, God has a character, you know, uh, that, that, that we are continually exploring and uh, finding out about. Uh, but he also has an enemy. And um, that is his other. Uh, when, when we, uh, as Christians, uh, and, I'll, and I'll just say as Christians, when we attempt to imitate God, when we attempt to follow what he wants and what he's doing and his plan, there is going to be an other. Because there is an other that opposes everything he stands for. Um, our problem is, is that we don't, um, I don't think we, we uh, exemplify the character of God enough. We're not, we're not as, uh, as accurate as we can be about what God is doing or what he is saying or what he's trying to accomplish uh, to uh, completely, you know, or to completely um, be in line with him as he faces his other. You know, the people of God are designed to uh, exemplify God. And then that, you know, that body of Christ or that body of Christ that exemplifies what he's doing then confronts the other in whatever way that appears, uh, you know, through, uh, if it's through destructive social movements or, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, bad actors in society or whatever, um, God has those that oppose him. And that is really what the other is. You know what I'm saying? I mean, did I make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, absolutely. Absolutely. So even as we say that there are always elements, those elements that uh, challenge the purpose and will of God for the world, there's also a moment of our affirmation to say that at any given time, the world, the church is not bereft of prophets, of those who work for justice. And that, I believe, is our... Uh, way to be in solidarity with those who share this common vision of justice. I'd like to put both these together so that it spells out the reality, our contextual reality for the church as well as uh, in our society, you know, more clear. Thank you. Sunny had a question. Hey, Sunny. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that was very, very uh, helpful. And I thank you also for all those questions, especially John's question of the othering. Uh, I know uh, somebody in the chat had mentioned about how Hinduitva as well as Christian triumphalism is of the same um, thought or the same mindset. And uh, to uh, to kind of address what John's talking about, how the Israelites, uh, they had issues with other Gentiles and all that. But if you think about uh, uh, Genesis chapter 12, right from the 
call of Abraham, it clearly says the purpose was to bless the families of the earth. So that was a kind of inclusing, uh, inclusiveness of the the forming of the nation was a channel through which he's going to bless all nations. So there's a specific purpose. And that's why they were chosen. And sometimes when you're chosen, it can go to your head. <laughs> <laughs> you might think you're so special that you push the others out. You forget about the calling, why you're chosen. And, and the other point I wanted to also mention is we have a, a lot of or post-biblical ideologies. What, what I mean by that is that the scripture has to be the one which informs us and our ideology. Scripture. Because you have so many different groups which come forth of their interpretation, their understanding. Even say, for example, if you're going against this particular Christian nationalism, invariably you will be forming your own ideology in opposition to that. So the closer you get to the scripture and, and be able to promote that, then all the other ideologies, whether it is Hinduatva or whatever it is, it'll fade in the background. And it's so important for us to kind of be as close as possible to the scripture. And, and it's not uh, Jesus who started this whole approach of loving the nations. It's right there in the Old Testament. And whether the Israelites obeyed or not, that's a different issue. So we do mm -hmm. have that. It's in the foundation. Absolutely, Sami. You know, one theologian by name, Letty Russell, puts it so beautifully. She says, that we look out for that prophetic principle that runs through the Bible. And if we fail to do that, we would turn the Bible into our own, you know, whatever we want and legitimize the same using the Bible. Mm -hmm. we, you know, it's so easy. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you look, you have this hermeneutics of suspicion, as it is called. When you look at these ideologies that are proposed, theologies that are proposed, that normalize violence, that normalize divisions and disparities. So it is Christian to bring in that element of suspicion, hermeneutics of suspicion, and say it is not biblical to divide and scatter. So uh, you make a difference between biblical and biblical going by that strand of justice that can, that's undeniably that runs throughout the scripture. And definitely, as I said earlier, it matters a lot as to what, from whose perspective we read the Bible, do our theologizing and keep up with our continuous struggle for justice. It matters. Yeah, the Im importance of having an international hermeneutical community will kind of reduce the hegemony of certain theologies over others. Because mm -hmm. you do see that happening. You know, some, you know, everybody looks at things through their framework, their tradition, or their theologies, what they, you know, and so it's, it, it's, it's so important to study the Bible in community. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to disagree, <laughs> you know, in community, mm -hmm. it kind of levels the playing field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have this whole, uh, some theologies, like they, they, they take the role of the, the, the patriarchy, uh, of all other theologies, you know, if I may use that term. Mm -hmm. Rajesh. Dr. Rajesh Sambad. Thank you. 
But coming back to John's point about the clash of civilizations, it is true. I mean, there is no single world religion that exists somewhere in some culture, society, or nation state that's not oppressing some other religious minority. It could be a Buddhist minority, it could be a Muslim minority, it could be a Christian minority, it could be a, uh, anti-Semitism, so a Jewish minority. But, you know, and we can talk about this, the complexity of different scriptures and texts with regard to both inclusion and the preservation of identity and what looks like exclusion or othering other people. But I come back to Ambedkar's Annihilation of Caste. There's a very striking issue where he's struggling to see even after one converts into the Abrahamic faiths or perhaps into the Eastern religions of Buddhism and Sikhism, that there's something intrinsic to the Hindutva and the Shastras and the caste system. And he says that if you look at the highest standing of a Muslim, who will always come to the aid of a less fortunate other Muslim, that there is compassion, there's concern across differences and same with Sikhs. But with Hindu caste, there is the positive propagation of antipathy, the sowing of jealousy and envy. This is his critique. And we know we've all heard the critique. We know the critique. And it looks like a whole scale condemnation of, uh, of Hinduism as a religion. He says religion, it, it has two principles, utility and justice. And Hinduism fails on both counts because of the caste system. If it didn't have the caste system, maybe something else. So I guess what, I, what I'm trying to get is, we, I think maybe we need to separate and this natural tendency that you're talking about, John, to other, because when it comes from the oppressed, at least the history of the Jews, from Pharaoh to the Shoah, the preservation of identity as a modality of survival um, is much different than the othering of some small minority and then the committing of violence. As you said, the silence colluding, uh, Pastor Dutchman. So. Uh, maybe we can bring it back to this focus. Where, where does our group feel about the, the, the role of liberation theology? And as I mentioned before, the embedicrite um, mm -hmm. quest to eradicate caste. And what do we do with the current politics? Asking the fox, as he said, is not the answer. Mm -hmm. I would uh, kind of uh, bring our attention to that focal point of the body. Because finally it comes to that body in which the casteism values, ideology is inscribed. You need a body. Casteism is not in the abstract. And in the Hindu ideology, you need God's body and the human Dalit body to be connected. To say that the, in God's body, the Brahmin's body, there is no place for a Dalit body. You are not anywhere in the Brahman body. You are out, outside the caste. I keep that in one, on one side. So the only antidote to that kind of a philosophy and ideology and a theology is, for me, the body of Christ that essentially says that you are all part of that one body, which stands directly opposite to the Brahman casteist body, to the body of Christ. And that's why, while formulating the title for this webinar, I intentionally put it as the body of Christ and not the church. Not the church. For us to Resignify the body of Christ in a new way. You know, that's that's one. And I do believe that Ambedkar, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, he just kind of uh, in a very prophetic way, he overturns those powers, those cables, you know, by hitting exactly where the cast, you know, you cannot, you cannot uh, lessen it, neutralize it little by little. It has to be annihilated. And uh, for us, 
when we speak of Dalit theology, when we talk about Christian theology, unless and until as a community, we believe that in Christ, there is no caste. There is absolute equality and show that in our everyday life and faith, the church taking the lead in this. It, it becomes part and parcel of our everyday life and everyday faith and role and simply everything, everything. So I, I will bring that word, the body back to the center and say, can the church, can Christian communities here in the US, there in India, everywhere in the world, can we believe, accept, affirm the absolute equality and equity, worth and value of that life breath? That for me is central center and in fact that becomes the criteria to check if a church loves caste more than christ body theology or christian faith uh, john has a question uh, the, the, thank you the the uh, the body theology is, is an interesting view um, so when you say the Dalit community, uh, those who are defined as Dalit are not in the body of Brahma. Are you, are you, are you just trying to clarify, you're not talking about, you're talking about the outcast, not the, the fourth caste, the fourth Varna. Is it? They are not even the fourth class. They are outside. Where does the fourth varna come? They say the feet. But to say that you are of lesser value, but you are still part of the body, there is no competition between being the feet, being, being a value, valueless body, and saying that you are not part of the body at all. For the Dalit, from a Dalit perspective, the aspiration is not to become part of that body. We don't want to be included in that Brahmanic body that is so stratified and devalued based on this Varna system, this ideology. So from a Dalit perspective, we begin with absolute equality and equity, affirmation of that body. Sorry, John, I can't Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand. So, so you are absolutely sure, are convinced that those who are defined today as Dalit, the broken, are twice broken, are not the fourth varna in the caste system. So they are outside of the caste system. They are the outcast. Hence they become the outcast. Okay. Yeah. Now, if they are not in the caste system, then technically they are not in the in the in the faith that that's created the caste system. <laughs> whether, whether it's a Sanatana Dharma or Saivism, or whatever you want to call it. Definitely not the Hinduism. The Hinduism is a British invention. Um, so I have, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I have, I have an idea, counter idea, and I want to throw it out to you and see what you think. So the people who are not included in the caste system, who, who stayed outside, are kept outside. We don't know how, you know, what happened, how it happened are the ones who did not accept the Hindu or the, uh, the, the Sanatana ideas, the Vedic ideas of the Brahma. Now, because they, were not, they, they did not accept the idea of 
Vedic principles. They did not, they never became part of that. Now, when did this imposition of these Vedic ideas or the, or the caste system based on Vedic ideas were brought into the, into the, the native population? Now it goes in you know, different regions, different areas, but in the modern, I would not say modern, but uh, in the history that we could put together, piece together, at least in the south of the, um, uh, south of Krishna river, if you will, becomes only after the Pallavas period. The Pallavas period is in the fourth century, right? The Pallava dynasty comes and establishes their base in Kanchi, Kanchipuram. And they bring the Brahmins, because of them, the Brahmins coming into the South, I would argue, because until then, even um, uh, one of the Pandya and uh, Pandya kings were given a title that was a, a, a stone inscription was found only a couple of decades ago in Cholamantan. Let's say the Pandya and the Arya Patagadanda Nedincharyan, meaning the, the one who won and defeated the Aryan uh, armies. And that was in the second uh, century. So, so you don't have the, the, the infusion of Brahmins or their ideologies of the Vedic doctrines into the Dravidian society until the fourth, fifth century. Now, only after the exception, um, only after uh, Mahendra Verma Pallava, becomes a Saivite, was, was, was accepted as a Saivite, as a Vedic uh, um, a member of the Vedic community, because he was kept outside. He was, they, were, they were Brahmin kings to begin with, because they were married into um, the Naga families, they were kept outside, they were kept as impure. Um, but then in the, during the Mahendra Varma Pallava, he was re or, um, uh, recognized as a Brahmin king. For the, for the kind of support that he was extending to the Brahmin families to come and settle in the South. Now, I'm giving this historic background to, to come to a point that during the time, those who did not accept this new ideology being imposed by um, the patronage of uh, Pallava kings and later by Chola and and Pandya, you know, Pandya, the first Pandya king to become a, a Saivite or the Vedic, uh, to, to follow the Vedic faith is, uh, is a Kun Pandya, not Sundra Pandya. Uh, that's in the seventh century. Until then, there was no Brahmin ideology. If you want, once you say there were no Brahmin ideologies, then there was no caste system. Now, those who accepted the Vedic ideologies becomes the, the four Varnas. They were in, inducted into the four Varnas. But those who did not accept this idea were kept outside of this. And that's why you know, they were not able to enter the temples. And now I call this, this, this creation of a caste-based economy as the most powerful socio-economic order uh, that, that was imposed on the people by the Brahmins who came and settled. Right. There is this confusion among people that, that I have spoken to some many Dalit scholars. Um, they seem to confuse the, the fourth Varna and the Dalits back and forth, you know. But there is no clear line between, I mean, in the socioeconomic uh, strata, both are pretty much in the same level. So no, once, once those who are kept outside were not able to sell or buy or interact or be engaged in otherwise economic activity of this socioeconomic political order that the caste system has created, then they over a period of time, they were up for the, they lost their land holdings. They became impoverished until the, of course, the, the European missionaries come and see, you know, that they were totally impoverished and excluded from the community. So that's the kind of an argument I bring to the thing. You know, I would like to see if, if you would agree that, that the difference that I draw between the, the, the fourth Varna and the, and the, and the Dalits, how does, it, how does it fit into your 
uh, uh, research that you know, obviously you have, you have done more research on that. How would you counter that or how would you explain it? For me, the starting point is experience, lived experience as Dalits, as communities. And when we once again map the violence that occurs, everyday violence that occurs against the Dalit bodies in history, once again, you find that it is targeted. The bodies are targeted. And you know that these bodies are identified as polluting bodies. So within that framework of religion, Hindu religion, the need to invent the polluting other in order to construct a very pure self was the way they put these ideologies of purity pollution and dismissing of the Dalit body as outside the Brahman body, putting it in the scriptures, making it as the Dharma, repeating it time and over time again and again to make sure that it is not an individual or an institution's uh, favorite lines, but to make sure people adhere to this as the religion. For me, the way Dalit history is narrated down history, dissociating it from the lived experiences of the Dalits then and now is problematic because however much I would try to understand the history of Dalitness or uh, Dalit uh, experience does not help me to explain why these Dalitized bodies dismissed bodies are forced to accept their, their inevitability. You, that logic of caste was invented for, to construct that pure self, the Brahmanic self. So uh, for us to see that the problem is not exactly whether the fourth caste and the outcast are lumped together. But if they are little better off than the Dalits, the untouchables and the outcasts, it doesn't help me. And that's why today in our engagement as Dalit uh, theologians, as well as when we work, say, say the anti-caste working group, we make sure that it is coming together of all, everyone, anyone who, who is against that caste framework, casteist framework, casteist ideology. And therefore there is that coming together of uh, what shall I say? The Dalits with, along with those uh, who are otherwise counted as lower caste. So it's a it's a way of uh, you know which which history do we validate? <clears throat> which history do we normalize? Which history helps us to understand? And my saying is, do we need a history that helps us to understand? Or do we need a history that reminds us, tells us that we are of the same equal worth? 
if there is such a history, that is the history I want. That is the history we need. So to correct our histories, to rewrite histories, or let me put it this way, write ourselves back into history will be the way we uh, reconstruct our identities as a community. Each time. Uh, I, yeah, each that time is, that is really important because um, um, the, the, the history that is being given to the world um, from the time there was a British archaeological, India archaeological society was created has been very uh, biased. So the places like the excavations in Keelody and other places is now bringing a different narrative. So that's going to create uh, a, a huge upheaval. I mean, I don't know how long it will take before, because there was a history before the, the Brahmins came uh, and, and, and created a Vedic society uh, among the people of um, the native peoples. Now, what were their life? What what was their life like? What did they do before the Vedic uh, ideologies came into their society? Is something that needs. Uh, somebody told me um, that if you try to do a research uh, in you know places like Madras University or some China University or somewhere, that the professors will not uh, uh, accept your your uh, doctoral thesis um so so there was a discrimination i mean not discrimination there was a discouragement for people to do more research and then that's changing slowly because the head of the departments are no more all the time uh, from the upper mm -hmm. cause so that that would this has to be you no know, more academic work needs to be done than people like us talking about it politically would it be, uh, I'll throw this out there, uh, would it be fair to say, you know, when we're talking about other, uh, othering others and othering different people or, or, or different types of people through a caste system or whatever other system you might come up with, is it fair to say that from the standpoint of the body, if you wish to say that, or the standpoint of Christianity and um, the concept that we are all descended uh, from the same um, lineage, that the other is any movement or group that tends to devalue any portion of the body. Uh, and and to speak to the uh, point about what a political stand, what political stand we take, uh, we take a political stand, and we take uh, an ideological and any movement that tries to devalue uh, a portion of humanity, um, and so so we stand against um, any Vedic uh, Brahmanism that would. Um, create an outcast or a fourth caste or any type of movement in the United States that would uh, devalue any other religions except Christianity or that would devalue blacks as opposed to whites or, or, or Asians as opposed to blacks or Native Americans. You know, that is the other. Uh, because God has given us, he's created us all in his image. And if we other different peoples, then we're in opposition to God and we are the other that opposes him. Mm -hmm. Maybe when I conclude, I would definitely respond to this and say, maybe I'll wait to the conclusion and say definitely affirmation of our commonality of life breath that has no color, all life, all hope is what we affirm as the absolute equalizing 
factor, equalizing reality and principle that God gives us. And if any power tries to stifle that life breath, kneeling on the necks of the Dalits, the Christians, or anyone considered, or when their humanity is diminished, I think it has, you know, if we, if the Christian community can take the lead in shifting the weight of that knee, that power knee of abuse, that will be our role, uh, you know, and describing aloud our identity, our lived identity as a Christian community. That's what I, I would say. But thank you very much for your comment. Sunny, you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I really appreciate you, Dr. Evangeline, for the emphasis on the body of Christ. And uh, in fact, when uh, you're bringing up the, the concept of Brahma, I was thinking of the body of Brahma actually created that hierarchy where the Brahmins dominate. So it was more like a power play. Whereas when you think of the body of Christ, if I may contrast, there's only one head. You know, Christ is the head and every member is, is equal. Mm -hmm. Having different roles. And so mm -hmm. all the denominations, even Fiocona, we embrace all denominations. You know, it's not we're not leaning towards one over another, you know. So that's just a, a, a powerful reminder for us that the emphasis is the body of Christ, where Christ is the head. Whereas uh, if you contrast those two bodies, you know, one is a power play game mm -hmm. and the other is not. So, mm -hmm. Thank you, Sunny. That's summarizing, yes. Absolutely. John, can you say a word of thanks? Me? This yes. John? Okay. Yes. John, so, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evander, for uh, uh, conversations that uh, sometimes, you know, we have to think of these ideas and, 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 and talk it out and, and see what other um, uh, different ideas out there to, for our own understanding to to clarify our own uh, thing. But, but definitely the idea of um, this cost system um, is something that, um, that needs to be addressed. It's becoming global just merely because of the diaspora of Indian diaspora in different countries and it's, it's, they're carrying their uh, issues there. So it's, it's an important, uh, subject. Uh, I think we have to start addressing it from the very early times and I'm glad that uh, you are able to talk about it and and uh, tell others and keep continuing to talk. I see that you have been talking about this issue in different places and in different forums and that's that's great and and uh, the, what the COVID voice one positive outcome that I can think of from COVID is that we all make this thing normal. You don't have to get on a plane and come somewhere and, and stay three days to give this speech. And this is all very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your time and your efforts. And for everyone um, that uh, asked the questions and contributed and participated and given your time, it's great having you all. And uh, invite a couple of other people, tell them that this is something interesting that, um, you know, like mental exercise, if you are. So um, thank you. Thank you again for everyone participating in it. Uh, thank you, Koshi, for putting it together and taking the time to organize it. I know it takes time and effort to organize all these things. Finding the speakers and, and scheduling it, coming up with a title and all those things takes time. And Koshi's efforts behind it is very critical for this thing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John. And thank you, Dr. Evangeline, for this uh, thought-provoking speech. And we really enjoyed it. A lot of information, you know, a lot of, uh, and everybody seems to have enjoyed and, and uh, participated in the conversation. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll close with a word of prayer. And I'm going to request Peter Cook to close, uh, 
closes with a word of prayer. And then uh, if anybody wants to step back and have further discussion, we can continue. Thank you. Dr. Peter Cook. Well, Evangeline, when's your book coming out? <laughs> that was amazing. That was, that was just a rigorous, thoughtful um, presentation. And I, I'm, I got a lot to think about here. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. Well, let us pray. A gracious and inclusive God whose fingers trace the widest expanses of the universe, whose thoughts are not our thoughts, we dwell in you. We thank you uh, today for such a powerful presentation from Evangeline who offers us a picture of what it means to be Christ in the world. Help us to hold that Christ in our hearts, in our mind's eye as we seek to faithfully serve you, to do justice, to counter discrimination at every turn and to live into uh, the promise of your inclusive Christian identity. We pray for um, so many who are suffering today, who have been excluded in some way or for Dalits, for African Americans in our own country, for all who suffer under the terror of nationalism and exclusivity. God, have mercy upon them, have mercy on all of us, and show us a more true and perfect way. Send us off into this good night for a holy rest and to follow in the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ, who suffered many things in his own life and yet offered us the radical hope, inclusive hope of his resurrection. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 So we'll turn off the recording and you are free to talk.